Good morning everyone and welcome to the webinar on how to use PowerPoint and other audiovisual tools more effectively so they have more impact and engage the audience. I read some research a few years ago that every day there's about 30 million PowerPoint presentations. So I guess on the days that I run my workshops, I'm one of those 30 million PowerPoint presentations being delivered on that day. And I'm not sure if this includes Keynote or Prezi or other presentation software, but certainly 30 million PowerPoint presentations per day, of which 29 million fail to have the impact, fail to deliver the message, fail to engage the audience the way the speaker had intended it to. In other words, probably 29 million of the 30 million were death by PowerPoint. So at the moment, about one in 30 PowerPoint presentations are effective. So the aim of this webinar is that you'll all walk away with a couple of skills that maybe will help you to be more effective in your PowerPoint, or if you choose some other audiovisual tool, how can I be more effective and how can I use this tool to add value to what I'm saying to enhance the audience reaction, to enhance the adult learning experience. I notice a couple of names that maybe I don't know. So how do you participate in webinars? Please ask questions as we go at any stage. I will pause a couple of times and say, are there any questions? But don't wait for that. Two ways you can ask questions. And that is by typing directly into the question dialog box and I'll see those questions. And if I don't answer it straight away, it could be that I'm going to hold it off later on. The other way is just put your hand up. You've got a little icon that when you click that, I see your hand going up. At the moment, no one has got their hand up. When you put your hand up, I can then open up your microphone and you can ask the question direct. So I'll leave it up to you as to which way you ask questions. But it's questions that make the webinar more interactive. Please take notes as you go participate in the webinar and I think most importantly is that you try to think and what I mean by think is is when I give you some information or I demonstrate something or I explain how you could use PowerPoint, think about the last time you used PowerPoint. Could have you applied any of these tools or these skills to that PowerPoint presentation or that presentation where you didn't use any audio visuals or think of a presentation you've got coming up. How can you use some of this material to make your next presentation more visually appealing, more visually engaging for your audience? So it, it's the thinking that's going to help you apply those tools that you find useful. So that's the way to participate in the webinar. What's the agenda for today? Uh, why use PowerPoint? If you're an engaging speaker, you tell some great stories and you involve the audience, then maybe you don't need to use PowerPoint. The common mistakes that people make when they're using PowerPoint. I'm going to give you some tips for eliminating the noise within your PowerPoint presentation and I'll explain what noise is. How to use SmartArt. SmartArt is a tool within most PowerPoint versions from 2007 right through to the current version 2013. Where do you get some graphics and images that you can use to support your PowerPoint? How to use flip charts. So you're not going to use PowerPoint but you want to use your flip chart or your butcher's paper. And then of course the other audio visual aids such as using a whiteboard, uh, handouts, using some props, a little bit on how to use those. The majority of this is around PowerPoint, but some of the things that I mentioned in using PowerPoint effectively would apply directly to other audiovisual techniques that you may use. So that's what I'd like to cover within the hour. So why is use PowerPoint? or some other audiovisual aid. You may have seen this data, this slide before. It's really quite simple. 
they did some study on retention rates. If you tell people some facts, you tell them some information, you share some data, then there's a 5 to 10% retention rate. If you add a visual image, a PowerPoint slide with a picture, with a model, if you hand out some sort of visual image, then you're increasing that retention rate to 25 to 30%. So straight away, the visual aid is potentially tripling your impact, your effectiveness, your retention rate. And of course, if you add a story that has examples and creates that emotion, the feeling, that emotional journey, then you can once again increase your retention rate. The use of stories is indeed a completely different webinar. So using visual aids, using PowerPoint, can enhance your message. You probably know there's visual learners, there's auditory learners and there's kinesthetic learners. So it helps the auditory learners remember stuff as well as appealing to the visual learners preferred means of communication. So that's why I use PowerPoint, that's why I use audio visuals. The visual image adds to the words, the facts, the data that you speak. So some common mistakes when using PowerPoint. Reading off your slides, one of the most, in my view, one of the most disrespectful things that a speaker, presenter, facilitator can do is to data project their PowerPoint slide and then read off that slide word for word. That's not presenting, that's not facilitating. PowerPoint is not your teleprompter, you're not a news reader, you're not the weather reader in which you read word for word off the screen as they roll down those words for you. So PowerPoint's not your reminder of what you need to say, it's meant to be an audio visual aid that adds, enhances, illuminates what you're saying. So don't read off your slides. Bullet points. You will notice in this presentation and those of you who've attended my workshops in the past, I just don't use bullet points. You need to convert the bullet point or the information into some sort of model, some sort of graph, some sort of hierarchical structure that is visually appealing. With bullet points we say you're shooting your audience to death and bullet points will help you do death by PowerPoint. Too much noise, I don't mean auditory noise, I mean stuff on your slide that is not really adding value. An example would be the page numbers at the bottom of your slide or your telephone number on the bottom of every slide, it's not really required. With this slide, with this particular slide, the picture may not even be necessary. One could say this picture is in fact noisy, but these are the common mistakes and you can see this audience is not engaged. But maybe I don't need that picture and you need to decide how much you strip your slides down, how much background noise you remove to make your slide pop, stand out, jump out and grab the audience's attention. Too many slides. I've seen people with 50 slides to present in an hour presentation. Just too many slides, too much information. I think if you've got that many slides, and even with scientific presentations, if you've got that many slides, you're probably over-reliant on the slides to give your information. There's some really good TED videos of a speaker named Hans Rosling, H-A-N-S. So just Google uh, Hans Rosling on uh, the TED videos and he does some really interesting scientific talks and he doesn't do too many slides but he brings his PowerPoint slides or his audio visual presentation, he brings it alive with his energy. One of Hans Rosling's TED videos is called The Best Damn Stats You'll Ever See. Don't do too many slides. 
leaving the slides up. So what I mean by that is you've shown some data or you've shown a trend or you've shown a model and you've discussed that, now you're moving on to something else or someone's asking a question a little bit away from that slide and you leave that visual slide up on the screen. So people are still looking at it but your conversation has moved on and you're now talking about something else. So I'm going to teach you how to bring that slide down. And not only do people leave the slides up, they then walk in front of them creating all sorts of shadow puppets, casting shadows as they walk across as they gesture on the image, casting shadows on the screen. So that's another reason to black your slides or bring the PowerPoint slide down. So they're common mistakes that I see in 90% of presentations where PowerPoint is used. So what do I mean by noise? And this is about eliminating the noise. Your logo, your web page, your page number, having lots of different colours, too much background, fancy fade-ins, you know the blinds, the Holland blinds as points are revealed, all the points that go twirly, whirly, whirly and then pop onto the slide, all that's noise. And then you do get the actual sounds, the points where a slide comes across, a point comes across with the sound of a cash register the ka -ching. you don't need that, that doesn't help your slide pop, someone should be able to look at a slide, it should be clean, lots of white space and people can say, aha, uh -huh, I understand what this slide is about. With some organisations you need your logo and your website on your slides, I encourage those people that you have the logo and your website and your contact phone number and all of that information on your opening slide and your closing slide. And I've had to work with some marketing and branding people that insist that that logo is on every slide. It is noise. It is not helping that audio visual enhance the presenter's effectiveness. So try and eliminate the noise from your PowerPoint slides. Let me give some examples of some good slides or bad slides. This could be my template. It's not my template, but it could be my template. So some stuff that I don't need at all. I mean, you don't need my photo. I can put my photo on my opening slide, but you're looking at me in front of the room anyhow. You don't need my corporate logo on every slide. What I'm about to reveal to you next, my logo has no value. Do you need to know that I'm only on slide 7 of 75? My website, my phone number, all of these things make this slide noisy before I've even put any data or any image on the slide. So that's what I mean by strip down your slides and remove as much noise as you can. This is bullet points. Point one, point two, point three, point four, point five. This is shooting your audience to death. And if these bullet points even were appropriate and what I wanted you to learn and take away, I've still got my logo. I've still got my website. All this noise that will draw your attention away from the five key points that I want to leave you with. Did you like that? That's called a bounce. I'll see if I can do it again for you. That's just noise. There's lots of other ways you can bring in slides. The, sw the swivel or the pivot, not necessary. Got my logo once again, so this is another noisy slide. So I've moved away from bullet points, which is good. I've converted those bullet points into smart art, into this five point model, but I've still got that noise. So take the noise away when you're doing your PowerPoint. I'm just going to pause for a moment and grab a glass of water. Any questions at this stage, put your hand up or feel free to type in the dialog box. So I've got a question from Violet, <laughs> it's a good question, why does PowerPoint 
have all these fancy capabilities? I don't have an answer to that. I guess maybe because you can. You can do fancy things and in the old fashioned way of doing PowerPoint, the more the more fancier you could reveal your points, maybe the cleverer you were perceived at using PowerPoint. But my philosophy has always been that in presenting, in educating, in coaching, in teaching, it's not about you, the presenter, it's about the audience. So it's not about how clever you are at using this software or PowerPoint tool, it's about how well you convey the core messages that you want your audience to walk away with. The other software, I used it for a while, it's called Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I, and I guess it's Prezi short for presentation, so it's presentation software. It's very clever, uh, it's very smart. It looks at your whole desktop as a canvas and you put your whole presentation on the canvas and then you zoom in and then you move up and you move down and then you zoom out and then you see the whole model. Very clever. For me it's a little bit noisy in the transitions are very jerky and it's not as clean as PowerPoint or Keynote. But it's great for, and you see it on TV sometimes, it's great for people that are talking and animating their talk and then the Prezi just maps what they're doing. But I still find it, I still find it quite noisy. Okay. No other questions? Then we will keep moving on. So I mentioned smart art. If you go to PowerPoint, you'll see at the top on your home on your home tab. So just the home PowerPoint tab, this is where you change all your your bold, your font. Here's convert to smart art. So when you do the bullet points that I showed you before, point one, point two, point three, point four, point five, that's a great way to capture the the points or the knowledge or the information you want to pass on. So when you do that, you can then go to the Smart Art tool and you can convert that to different models. Once again, this is a noisy slide because of all the page numbers of the website. So let me give you a couple of examples of Smart Art. I've now converted those five points and if it's sequential, then this particular tool do this, then do this, then do this, do this, do this, and then you'll get this wonderful outcome, which is 0.5. What I'd rather see is I'd rather see that. I've removed my logo. I've removed my website. I've removed the page number. So that stage, that slide, to me, pops more than that previous slide. You've seen my logo on, on my opening slide. You, you know my website. You've got my mobile number. You don't need to know that we're on page 13 of 75. By the way, I don't have 75 PowerPoint slides. I think that's a cleaner slide. Let's use Smart Art again. Same five points. Now we're building more of a pyramid and you can't do anything until you've done point five. So it's not sort of leading to something, it's, this is the basis of building, this is the basis of building something. You see the pyramid in the food groups, the five food groups, and at the base is your, I think your carbs and your protein. Still a noisy slide, so I'd rather take my logo away, and that's just five points using Smart Art. I want to talk to you now about crop yields. So this is, I'm now doing some data, so a bar graph or a line graph or some other model. This is a very noisy slide. Very noisy slide in my view. But some people might think it's, you know, quite a nice slide. Look at the beautiful colours. There's my nice logo. You'll be pleased to know we're on page 17. And just in case you're not sure what a crop is, I've put a picture of wheat down there. So we're talking about wheat crops. Very noisy slide. I've probably made this one a little bit too obvious for you, but it is a noisy slide. What do I mean by the slide needs to pop? What happened in 2003? There was a drought in 2003. 
That's all this slide is about. That's all that I want to talk about. What happened in 2003? That is what I want to talk about. That's the purpose of this slide. Our crop yield went down from 70 to 80 tonne per acre per hectare to 20 to 30 tonne per hectare. What happened? And of course it's the drought. So that's what I mean by trying to make your slides stand out, trying to make your slides pop and eliminating the noise. Let me go back, there's that slide, same data, same information, lots of pretty colours, nice looking slide. That one is going to have greater impact from your audience's perspective. So where do you get your graphics and images from? There's a few sources that you can use and the first one is Microsoft Clipart has got much better. I've now got Office 2013 and when you go to Clipart you don't just get those cartoons, those scratchy type images, those poorly defined graphics, you get really good high quality photographs. Because you've brought Microsoft Office, those Microsoft Cliparts come royalty free, so they're yours to use commercially. Most of my images come from iStockphoto.com and I also get a lot of images from DepositPhotos.com. You can also use your own photos. When you take your own photo, you don't need to pay anyone to use it. With iStockphoto and with Deposit Photos, these two, you buy them on the website. So you go to their, their website and you choose an image or a photo or a model that suits what you want to talk about and then you pay a dollar, a dollar twenty, depending on the size of the photo and, and the resolution you want. The higher the resolution, the dearer the photo. I normally get the lowest or the one up from the lowest resolution for my PowerPoint presentations. I'm not presenting big posters or flyers. I'm not using graphics for newspapers. So the lower quality normally does my purpose, serves my purpose well. You can design your own using PowerPoint, using Microsoft Paint or some other design software. Make sure your images are royalty free and also copyright or not copyright, that you're not breaching copyright. So here's some images that I made with one of my workshops in one of the workshops that I do about overcoming your nerves and your fear of public speaking, I get people to turn their nerves into excitement. So what I mean by that is it's the same physiological reaction, your heart's pounding, your adrenaline is flowing, your blood vessels are vasoconstricting, you're excited or you're nervous, it's the same thing. Your, your voice will quiver a little bit when you're excited, your palms will get a little bit sweaty when you're excited. So I get people to remove nerves from their vocabulary and replace it with excitement. That is my image. I designed that. I just used PowerPoint. Just going back, I've just had a comment from, from Kyla. Another source of image is canva.com, C-A-N-V-A.com. And it has a lot of cool images and graphics that you can use for free or pay for. And even when you go to uh, Google and you Google some images and you realise that there's no copyright, so it's, it's open to use, there's, there's different versions. There's one's called Creative Commons where it's free to use but not for commercial use. So if you are going to use it at school or you're going to use it you know, to entertain your family or friends, that's fine. If, like me, you use images to earn your living, then you need to make sure that although it may be 
uh, royalty free or free of copyright, it may be not for commercial use. And so I see that you can pay for images or you can get some free ones from canva.com. Thanks for that. I'm going to have a look at that after this webinar. So that's just in PowerPoint. Here's some deposit photos. Wow, I hope you guys are all sitting up like that as I speak to you now. This is the audience I want. They're showing some really good active listening skills. They're smiling. They're moving forward. They're in the zone. You can see that they're, they're reflecting and modeling the image, the image and the energy of the speaker. That's what happens when you engage your audience. This person just happens to be doing death by PowerPoint. I'm hoping, <laughs> I can't see you, I'm hoping that none of you are dozing off or nodding off. One of the joys of webinars is you're just speaking to a blank screen and you're hoping that you're engaging the audience at the other side and that's why the questions and the comments are so valuable. So thanks for that comment and that question, Kyla. Some other images I use, this is a model that I also downloaded and the words, in fact I downloaded the image, the words are my own words and I can use this model for different, for different aspects. One of the things I talk about is how do you bring the right attitude when you speak before a group of people and I say communicate with care. So I could put C for care which is conviction, A would be the right attitude, R would be responsibility, when you're speaking you've got a lot of responsibility to the audience and E would be the energy level. So this model I can use over and over again by putting in my own words. So I don't have to reinvent that model. I've brought the image, it is mine to use, it's mine to adapt. So that's another way you can get your visuals for PowerPoint. I like simple images. If I was talking about the fear of public speaking again, sometimes the mere act of passing someone a microphone, that by itself is enough to put fear into many people and as you know, Fear of public speaking is mankind's number one fear. Simple images, do you pass the authenticity test? Are you genuine? Are you honest? Are you passionate? Simple images, preparation, 80% of every presentation, 80% of this webinar, I'm spending an hour speaking to you. I've probably spent five or six hours preparing making sure I know my content, getting the right images, doing all the back end of the office. This is what the audience sees, the tip of the iceberg. This is all my preparation beforehand. So use these kinds of images. I think they're, they're simple, they add value. You don't need to put words. Keep it simple. When I'm talking about speech structure, I like people to have three to four points in their image and I talk about be on, be brief, be seated and less is often more. The gold person, bang, straight through, leaves the audience with the point. The grey person gets there in the end but weaves around the bush just a little bit. So simple images is what I like to use if you're going to use images in PowerPoint and you can, as you've done, as you've seen with me, I combine sometimes a small image with some words or some smart art so you can mix and match some graphics that you've designed with some photos that you've imported. Any other questions or comments around images, some graphics, does anyone have any other ideas where you, where you can get good graphics from? I'm just going to pause for a moment. So someone's asked about using your own photos and I've neglected to put my own photos within this. I hired a, prof a professional photographer who spent just one hour with me and I did as many gestures 
different body movements, uh, different hand gestures as I possibly could, good ones and bad ones, so ones to avoid, so one is the fig leaf, so hands folded in front of your crotch, uh, another one is behind your back, which we call the sergeant major, so I've got a whole stack of about 150 photos of my hands doing different images, and one of the webinars that I do is how to gesture powerfully and effectively, and I use all these different images of my hands. So that's an example of where you can use your own photos. I don't mean just grab, you know, like a family photo, and I have seen someone do that. Uh, so this is my house, and I live in Adelaide, and there's the trees, and there's my dog, and there's the three kids, and I'm thinking, hang on, what's your point? What are we here to talk about? So don't use family photos unless there's a real purpose for showing that photo. Brilliant. Moving on. Remember I said at the front, don't leave your PowerPoint slides up. Don't walk in front of the data projector and create shadows. One of the mistakes people do is they leave a slide up and they now go on and talk about something else. And the visual, so people are looking at the PowerPoint slide, bears no relationship to what you're now talking about. Or the question that you're now answering, which was from an earlier slide, is no longer related to the image on the screen. So I'm going to show you, if you don't know already, the magic of the B and the magic of the W button on your keyboard of your laptop. So you are in the middle of a PowerPoint presentation. All I'm going to do, I'm not inserting any black slides, I'm not inserting any white slides. All I'm going to do is hit first the, the B button on my keypad in front of my computer. I'm going to hit the B button. That's all I'm going to do. The B button immediately turns your PowerPoint to data projecting black light. The screen goes blank. You can now walk into the middle of the room and you can talk to the people, you can engage them, you can ask them questions, you can answer that difficult question. So B for black, how do you get the screen back? Hit B for black and it comes back. Obviously the W is for white and sometimes a white screen is better than a black screen. You need to work that out with your own training room, your own I guess dynamics and setup of that facility. When I hit W, I just get a white screen. If your data projector is on some low low object like a table or, or a trolley and you walk in front of it, you will cast a shadow with the white light. You won't cast a shadow with the black light. If the data projector is fixed in the roof, shining onto the, onto the screen and it's above your head, you can now walk in front of it with a white screen. So if you're data projecting on a white wall, sometimes the white light is better than the black light. So that's the magic. And how do I get it back? I just hit the W. That's the magic of the B and the W button while you're doing your PowerPoint presentation. If you have one of those little clickers, those PowerPoint clickers, they also have a button that blacks the slide. You just need to make yourself familiar with that. You know, the Logitech uh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint controllers. That's PowerPoint. In fact, before I speak about flip charts, I'm just going to pause any other questions, concerns, issues around PowerPoint. How do you feel not putting your corporate logo on every slide? Is that going to cause mayhem in your workplace? And it does, I've just had a comment, it does, it does depend. If you're working for yourself, you can do exactly what you want to do. If you have some influence over the CEO in a small organisation, you can just explain that the marketing should be the first and the last slide, and then in between is the message. All the slides in between are the message for the audience. If you're like me and I worked for the health department of Western Australia for 30 years, not only did we have a logo and a website on every slide, but we also had these colours on the background of every slide. And that was the corporate template that you had to use every time 
you went out to present on every slide. You just have to get to the marketing people and convince them. I was a little bit autonomous within the health department, so I removed the logo and I removed the website off all the slides, but the first and last. Uh, I never got told off. I survived. I'm not recommending you break the law. I'm not recommending you put your job at risk, but clean slides are better than those noisy slides. Flip charts. I love to use flip charts. For me, flip charts can be really, really effective. And I like to have a couple of flip charts in the front of the room, either side of my screen for, for PowerPoint. Flip charts are really good for spontaneous stuff, for capturing ideas, for, for unfolding models at a slightly further depth. If the PowerPoint raises a question and you need to deconstruct or go further, you can do that with a flip chart. Where to stand when you have a flip chart? I did a workshop yesterday and I saw this perfectly. Someone stood bang in front of the flip chart and then wrote up their model, which was four arrows, and then they stepped back and they revealed it. If you're right-handed, you should stand where those feet marks are. And what you can do is you can write, and as you write across the page, you are revealing the points or the diagram as you write it. And you can also, without moving, you turn your head slightly back towards the audience so you can see their reaction and your eyes can move between your drawing and the audience and your back is not facing the audience. I love to have two flip charts as I mentioned. One of my flip charts is pre-written so I will reveal, I'll turn back a page and I'll show a model that I've already written up. So the prime the prime model or the or the communicate with care, conviction, attitude, responsibility, and the right energy. So I can reveal that. And you can leave the front page white so when people walk in all they see is white paper. And then you reveal your first model or you reveal the agenda. The other one can be for your brainstorming or for your parking lot, so in your introduction or as you take questions and you don't want to answer that question right now, you say, look, that's a really good question. I'm going to cover that, I think, later on. I'll just write it up on the parking lot. So the second flip chart does not interfere with your pre-written flip charts. Let me give you a little trick with flip charts as well. One of the things you can do is With a lead pencil, you can write your little models, your statistics, something to remember across the top of your chart in pencil so that when you walk up to it, you can see it, but no one in the audience will be able to see it. And you can do this on your pre-written charts. So when you come up, the paper is blank. And then you reveal some fantastic statistics. So now I'm using my memory. If you give people information, they have about a 10 to 15% retention rate. If you add an image to that data, to that information, you increase the retention rate to 25 to 30%. If you tell stories, then you increase that retention rate from 45 to 60%. Now, I don't know how well I remembered that data. Had I had it written up on that flip chart in light pencil that I can read clearly as I walk up to it, the audience is going to say, wow, Peter really knows his stuff. So that is one way that you can prepare in advance that makes you look like you've got a good memory, really well prepared, makes you look very confident, makes you look very credible. So as I said, I love to use flip charts. Because I travel a lot, I can't take flip charts with me, and a lot of the training rooms I go to don't have flip charts, but I just make the best, make do with the best I can. I do sometimes carry those, those small handheld flip charts that you get from Officeworks, and they've got sticky paper, and if I've got lots of wall, I can then stick that sticky paper on the wall. And that's the other thing, you can tear it off and you can park it on the wall. 
so people can walk around in their breaks and look at all the models and all the statistics and all the points you've unveiled during the day. So that's a little bit on flip charts. Some other visual aids you can use. Handouts. It's sometimes appropriate to do handouts, just an image or just a model or just a question sheet that people fill in as they go. I use whiteboard quite a lot. There are props, so props are things that I bring with me. I often bring books. I, when I talk about getting feedback, how do you get feedback? I sometimes bring a video camera and just tell people, get someone to video record you, hand over your digital uh, camera and to someone you trust and say, hey, can you video record my five minute introduction? Just by bringing a video camera with me, people will remember, they'll understand the role of the video camera. I mentioned put your flip charts on the wall and use video. I often embed video into my PowerPoint slides. I sometimes have video standalone and I just put the CD or the DVD into my, into my laptop and I will then play that, that video. Sometimes when I'm hot, so with my internet, I can then go to a TED video if that's where the audience takes me and then I can quickly download that video in morning or afternoon tea and show you, oh look, this is the, this is the video I was uh, talking about. I did, mentioned, I did mention Hans Rosling. Here's five minutes of that TED video. This is the five minutes that I think really shows you what he does. So use video. It's, it's really quite effective. So whiteboards. Whiteboards are good. Try, if you can, to stand the same as with your flip charts. In other words, don't put your back to the audience as you're writing. If you can stand side on to the left-hand side if you're right-handed or to the right-hand side if you're left-handed and kind of reveal your, your material so people can see it as you write it. The problem with whiteboards, unless you've got a fancy one that you know, you press the button and it's got three different sides, so you hide it and then another one comes out, is that you've got to take your whiteboard stuff off and then you've got to sort of put it on. It's harder to pre-write. If you do pre-write, people come in and they're looking at it straight away and sometimes you've already revealed something on the whiteboard that you would rather reveal by revealing a, a PowerPoint slide or by turning one page in the flip chart over to reveal some model that you've already prepared. So you can't put the whiteboard images up on the wall. With the electric ones you can sometimes copy them but what I encourage people to do is before I wipe, wipe stuff up, if you want to take a photo on your smartphone, if this, if this particular model interests you, I'll just leave it up for a few minutes while you feel free to take a photo. Some of the props, some of the ways you can use props. I often take books. One of the things I say to people is you need to get your opening really tight, really sharp, 30 seconds. You've got about 30 seconds to create impact in your opening. Milo Frank is one of the experts in uh, communication. He writes for, for American politicians and he teaches people to get their message across in 30 seconds or less. And one of the things that Milo Frank says, if you don't have attention, if you haven't created relevance within the first 30 seconds, you could potentially spend the rest of your seminar, your workshop trying to create relevance. I mentioned the video camera. When I'm talking about how to respond to questions, and that comes from my thinking and speaking off the cuff workshop, I talk about the bucket model and how you need to have a bucket of answers already prepared and when someone asks you a question you work out which question from my bucket am I going to use to answer that question. So I've got a little coloured bucket that I can sometimes bring along to my workshops. Whatever props remind you what you need to talk about and when you hold up and you can pass the book around, people learn from it or they get value from it. I guess that's use of some props. I'm going to pause for a moment. Are there any questions at this stage? Anyone got any other ideas of props that you can use?
when you're presenting. And it's really anything that acts as a trigger for you. In fact, props works for two reasons for me. Props helps the audience, I guess, visualise and conceptualise what I'm saying. And the prop can be a photo that you hand around. The prop also acts for me as one of the anchors to remind me of what I need to speak about. In most of my presentations, and I mentioned the Keep It Simple principle, I talk about three points. So if I had three props that I brought up, and each prop for me visually represented point one, and then the second prop represented point two, and the third prop represented point three, I could have them in front of me on uh, the desk or off to the side, and as I go to point one, I would grab that prop, and I'd straight away know what I'm going to talk about for the next half an hour, and I'd use that prop to illustrate the video camera, the importance of feedback. How do you get feedback? Feedback is the food of champions. I'm now on my way to talk to you for 30 minutes about how to get feedback and why every time you present, every time you speak, you should get feedback. So props is one of the anchors for me, but people will now, if I pass that video camera around, they'll now understand that they need to be able to, or one way of getting feedback is to video record themselves. Great way of getting feedback. Okay. No other questions? We're a little ahead of time, but that's okay. I've got some workshops coming up, guys. If anyone's interested, just go to my website. I'm busy, Melbourne, back up to Karratha on the 24th. I was in Karratha on Monday, Tuesday of this week, off to Coffs Harbour and Grafton on the beautiful North New South Wales coast in March, and then Bendigo and Mildura, rural Victoria, and of course Melbourne CBD. And those of you who are Perth based, April 14, 15, 16 are the next round of workshops. My next webinar is next is the 19th of February and it's a roundabout job interview skills. And I do a workshop on thinking and speaking off the cuff. A lot of people who come to thinking and speaking off the cuff come because they struggle at job interviews. So if that's of any value to you, feel free to register for that webinar. Once again, go to my website and you will see that one of the tabs down the side is free webinars, so feel free to register for that, the same as you registered for this one. I'd love you to follow me or like me on my, on my Facebook page, uh, Public Speaking Dynamics. I try and put a tip, a public speaking tip, just about every day or, or every second day on Facebook, so that's another way of making use of me. Any final questions before I end the webinar? And for those of you who need to go, thanks for, thanks for participating. Remember PowerPoint, your audio visuals are not to replace what you say, they're to add value, to amplify your message, to help the audience take away your key messages. They're not your teleprompter, they're not a reason to under-prepare and rely on PowerPoint as your means of presenting. So use your audio visuals. I think PowerPoint's a wonderful tool. Just use it effectively, use it confidently, and don't, don't do death by PowerPoint.